director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Utah. And um, uh, we welcome you all. Many of you have been here already for the Asian uh, art history workshops. Um, but for those of you who haven't, this uh, workshop initiative came out of uh, informal conversations actually with Cheryl Hughes, um, where we realized at uh, the Asia Center and the Center for Latin American Studies that the AP art history curriculum had been revised with enhanced content from Asia and Latin America. And part of our mandate is to um, strengthen and support um, uh, Latin American studies and Asian studies curriculum and uh, in, in international education and language study. And so this seemed like a perfect uh, fit with our, uh, our uh, mandate uh, through uh, Department of Education, Title VI, Department of Ed uh, National Resource Center. So we, we both the Asia Center and, Latin, and the Center for Latin American Studies are uh, Department of Education designated area studies national resource centers. And so we serve as a resource for uh, the university uh, and also the state, region, and nation. And so, um, the next two workshops are on Latin American. Uh, and we just have a couple of things to, little just logistic things to take care of before we get started. One is that we have, for those participants in the two earlier Asian workshops, we have textbooks for you with a sign out sheet. So if you grab those, um, do you want everybody to get them now or just before they go and sign them out? Um, if you get them now, that'd be better because we're going to use that table for food if you haven't gotten them for those. We only have enough for those who actually participated in the previous workshop. So um, there's a name. Let's just sign out um, when you pick it up. Right. So, yeah. yeah. yeah you do it now. If that would be great. And we also have a sign up sheet that will go around with. If you please give us your name and your school and district and your email address. And the third thing is that we, this is one initiative of our grant that will be evaluated. And so you will be contacted, if you're willing, by our evaluation folks at the College of Education at the U um, to answer a survey and some, a questionnaire about your experience and its impact on your curriculum. So if you'd be so kind to participate in that, we'd greatly appreciate it. Just please make sure you uh, write down your name and uh, email address whether or not you have signed up before, because that's how we're keeping track for the continuing ed purposes. Great. So um, with that, yeah. Just one question about that. Um, I know that you're handling this continuing ed recertification, but um, Laura Decker also sent an email today saying the museum was going to do something, so to give also credit for people. So we probably should join together and do that. Right. We can provide information with that as we go along. So today, um, we're very fortunate. That, well, and also the second, as you will have received in the email, the second Latin American Studies Workshop will be April Saturday, April 25th, from 9 to 2 o'clock, also here in the UMFA. And tonight, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Amy Mono here from uh, actually having just arrived from Brazil. <laughs> and I've just asked her to introduce herself a little bit, and then we'll get started. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. Hi, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today and to, and to have this, this time to talk about this material together as a group. Um, my name is Amy Buono. I'm a professor at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, and I'm a specialist primarily in uh, 16th century Latin America, so right around the period of, of contact and conquest. Um, but I've worked extensively both in pre-Columbian and colonial Latin American um, art. I got my degree from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I've taught, um, I taught previously at Southern Methodist University, actually in Texas, before my move to Brazil, where I'm um, beginning a new career um, in a very far away place, and it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, so today I wanted to try to make this at least as informal as we possibly can, give, I mean, given the structure of this room and, and the fact that we're a large group, but I wanted, to make sure that um, you feel free to sort of ask as many questions as you want to and, and that we can make this much more of a dialogue, um, if you will. I assigned for all of you today um, the article by Carolyn Dean called The Trouble with the Term Art um, for us to read. And before actually getting into the material, and I've segmented this off so I've, I've chosen to sort of illustrate with a PowerPoint each of the objects that's in your set 
in your set list that, that has to deal with the indigenous and ancient Americas, and I've tried to contextualize them as best I can with other images around them that you might not have. But I, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to organize this, is I thought we could talk a little bit about the article, just because I think it sets up some basic sort of terminology for our discussion. Then I want us to go through the objects, and then after dinner, I wanted to open up the session really for a kind of back and forth Q&A or a general discussion about problems or issues or anything you might have um, as teachers um, in the classroom with this material. So first off, um, I actually chose this piece. Carolyn Dean is one of my favorite authors. Um, she's an Andeanist. And I thought this piece does a really good job about, about just showing us how sometimes using the designation art or talking about um, art as such um, can, be, can be problematic. And I, and I think she has some great examples and illustrations of what it means to use this term when we step inside the world of, of the ancient Americas, and especially in her case, into, into the world of the Andes. And so to start us off, um, why does she sort of, um, what is the problem with the term art here, as she's putting it, in terms of thinking about it in terms of Western terminology and categories? Anybody? Did, did, did you enjoy reading this piece, or? Yeah, good. You know, there, was, there were several things. Um, one is that it's a, it's a sort of a Western concept, mm -hmm. you know, the aesthetics, or, and that we're applying Western um, criteria for judging to works that weren't necessarily produced for a similar purpose, mm -hmm. um, which ends up relegating these works to a place that somehow, you know, they don't seem to measure up. Um, there was also a comment about we like things that are iconic or we like things that look like... Things we recognize, world, things right. We recognize, yeah. You know, and that's the abstraction yeah. here was problem. But it also said that it's the modern world yeah. sort of embraced abstraction. Some yeah. of that changed a little bit. Right. But, you know, it's obviously going to be a problem we're all going to face. Mm -hmm. I mean, because suddenly, you know, we have 80 works that mm -hmm. are now supposedly part of this new canon. Mm -hmm. And we all have um, methods of looking at art that we've learned for our Western works, and now suddenly we're supposed to include these works and find a way to give them honor and space and dignity mm -hmm. and substance, but we don't really have perhaps the language with which to talk about them right. in a way that gives them the dignity they deserve. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that... And I think your, I mean, I, I think your point that, I mean, in the point that she makes in this article is we tend to look for things that look like things we recognize, right? And I think that's a really poignant concept that we're, we look for iconicity. We look, we want to recognize things in the world. And part of the problem here is that we can't recognize things, right? It doesn't, it's just foggy. It's all very foggy. So um, I, I think she does make the, the important point that we have to, in a way, instead of approaching things from our culture today, looking back at time, we have to do the best we can to sort of step inside the, the cultures that we're talking about. And how do we do that? And you know, what are her methods, or what, what is she? What possibilities does she give us for stepping inside these worlds? Because in a way, she tries to help us. She doesn't give us a solution necessarily, but I think she tries to to give us some advice or about what are what are ways that we can cope with this material. How do you step inside the ancient world, cultures of the ancient world? Any thoughts on how, what her strategy is for doing it? You, can't, you cannot ever, I think, yeah. look at art in isolation. I don't mm -hmm. know what country it comes from. Sure. If you haven't made sure that you've immersed yourself in a cultural context to some degree, then you're just looking at the work of artists. Oh, that's great here. I don't like that. As opposed to uh, making sure Without that, then we don't have any real frame of reference for deciding A is a work of art, B is a procedure, what is the public's relationship to it? Right, right. And so how do we how do we step inside, do you think? One of the things I think you talked about was the fact that we have to see <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we have to see things in terms of uh, of where it's placement and its location okay. and things. So we watch on the Artists, something on the wall, or something put on a pedestal. Yeah. It's, it's 
significant location and placement, not just immediate surroundings, but the entire surroundings. Okay, so again, this idea of the spatial dynamics, that an object exists in space and time. So one, one way is to sort of situate it in a kind of geographic location. Um, we can understand it through that. She also says we need to understand it through language, right? And so how is language important here? The Inca and the Aztec aren't speaking English, right? So in order for us to understand anything about the Inca, the Aztec, the Maya world, the Olmec world, we have in a way to understand the importance of language and be able, be able to, to step into understanding conceptual terms from inside the culture and how those terms might help us give us a sense of an aesthetic appreciation of the object or the thing, the building that we're looking at. So again, so that's another strategy. We have a kind of a spatial, we have to kind of reconstruct a kind of a spatial world for the object. And we have to reconstruct, in a way, a terminology, language that we can use that might assist us in being able to um, approach the object from inside the culture instead of from outside. I mean, we're always, to, you know, to a large degree, we're always outside, of course. But we have to do our best as historians to, to get in, right? Um, and she gives the example, I mean, I think this is wonderful. Her, her latest book as a scholar is on rock. And she just published this book with Duke University Press, and I can't even remember, but it's, it's called something like Inca Stones, or I, I can't even remember, actually, it's a more poetic name. But I think she gives some great examples visually in this piece to show us that what we think of as art might not be what, in a way, the Inca world thought of as art. So what does she say about stonework and why it was important? How are stones, in a way, not just things in a geographic expanse. What are they to her in, in her discussion of this piece? Because I think this, this too is poetic and shows us something about how the world in a way is animated in the pre-Columbian context. Are these just stones? <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, there are two great examples. She shows this Puma rock from Cusco, Peru, right here which is radically different than this um, Inca carved monolith, okay, right here, that's carved from the previous page. What is the distinction she makes between these two kinds of rocks? I remember, <laughs> on, on the, uh, the Inca one, it was more of a functional object to place sacrifices on, or offerings on, is that right? So it's more like Okay, 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 yeah. Well, part, part of it is, but let's, in a way, step back for a second. If you just look at these visually, forget what, in a, forget in a way how they function, but if you look at these visually, this rock versus this rock, how are they different visually? One is carved. Is the other carved? Okay, it's just a rock. Is one more important than the other, or one more of an artistic creation than the other? In her discussion. Okay, okay. So she basically, she tries to reconstruct the world of Inca rock, and rocks are called wakas, okay, okay. Wakas are animate, alive things, okay. They're not just pieces of stone, they're alive things. And she's trying to show in this article how an uncarved rock is as much an artistic expression as a carved rock. How do we know by looking at the uncarved rock that it might be important, just visually? Placement, Okay. Place. And what's around it? The, exactly, it's the border. It has this fabulous frame around it. I mean, you could think of this as like framing devices for art and you know, frames are incredibly important in any discussion of the presentation of art, right? This rock has an incredible frame around it, which is telling us that it is set aside in the world and it has a kind of aesthetic importance, right? And she talks about these as sites, pilgrimage sites, important rocks that you go to at different times of the year. Um, and that's radically different than a rock like this, which is both uncarved and carved. Okay, so she's showing us a distinction in different kinds of rocks. Okay, in a way, this is far too specific in a way for 
our discussion today. You're not dealing, any, none of your objects are rocks per se. But the point to be made here is that she, she's showing us that she's trying to get inside the sort of Inca aesthetics and artistic production through understanding different kinds of carving and different kinds of rocks and the many names that there are for, for stones in the Quechua language. Okay, and through that she's showing us we can have some sense of an artistic appreciation, a sense of a kind of aesthetic from inside. So I think it's a, it's a great, it's a fantastic example because most people, if they just go to um, visit Cusco and see this, might be a little bit stunned at first to think of this as a, an important artistic object or shrine, right? And she's showing us, no, we have to sort of reconsider that. Okay. Um, and it's through, in a way, this idea of um, vocabulary that, in a way, the field of art history as a discipline, I think, has a way to sort of contextualize these, these objects outside of just an archaeological context, okay? Which, which has largely been the traditional way to approach these works, okay? So even within the field of pre-Columbian art, um, these issues are um, developing and there, there are large debates about how we as art historians versus people in other fields can approach the same material. And that's something we can think about as we look through the objects today, too. What is it that our discipline, you're teaching art history, you're not teaching another subject, you're not anthropologists, right? I mean, you're in a class teaching art history. So what is, what's at stake in your discussion versus the stakes of somebody who's teaching this from an anthropological perspective? So we, we need to think about that, too. OK. Hi there. <laughs> OK, so we have our two maps. Um, thank you, uh, Rebecca, for um, producing these. So we have one for Mesoamerica and one for the Andes. And I wanted to just get started with some real basics, nuts and bolts of things that might actually be useful for you as, as teachers. First off, um, there are two wonderful books that provide pretty much most of the bibliography you would need to discuss any of these objects and most a, a kind of a general discussion. So Art of the Andes from Chavin to Inca, and I have these up, up here. Um, by Rebecca Stone Miller, and The Art of Mesoamerica from the Olmecs to the Aztecs by Mary Ellen Miller. These two books will provide much of what you need. I don't know if it's possible that these can be ordered later, or, but they're things that are, that are in a, you know, largely fairly inexpensive to get a hold of. Most libraries have them. They're great resource books, and they might even be on Google Books online to look at. I mean, that's, that's, it's quite possible. Okay, great. Yeah, great. They're inexpensive. They're paperback. They've got most of what you need. So I recommend that, and they're, and they're, they're well illustrated. OK, <clears throat> in terms of images, and this might be equally use useful for you as well as to your students, um, Dana Liebson and Barbara Mundy just, um, they've long had a wonderful database of images called Vistas that's online, and they just updated it recently this last week. Um, and I, I'm hoping I can. Can we get onto it? Yes. Okay. Here it is. It's actually quite wonderful because it has, and this may be more useful for your latter sections that you're going to be doing on colonial than it will be for pre Columbian, but they have a mix of pre Columbian and colonial images in high resolution that you can download and that has dates and context. Okay, this is a wonderful resource. When I teach undergrads, this is I, you know, one of the first things that I give them, and I think it's, it'll be great for your students as well and for use in the classroom, because sometimes it's hard to get high-res details of, of um, many of these objects. So for example, you know, again, this isn't a, um, a pre-Columbian object, but it is an early colonial one, and, and we can see it's a, it's a biombo or a folding screen. And it gives detailed um, information about date, height, um, materials, where it's located, and back and forth, and things like that. So this is, it's a great, it's a great website to remember. Okay. The other, oops. The other very useful one is the FAMSI website. Where can I, sorry, hold on. I don't know why my mouse isn't, okay, thank you. Oh. 
Okay. FAMZ is the foundation for the advancement of Mesoamerican studies. It's an important organization for scholars working um, in Mesoamerican studies. But what it has, which is fabulous, is it has um, maps, discussions of um, basic information and chronologies on each different pre-Columbian culture that you can just pull up and use. So, for example, it has map by cultural areas, country maps, linguistic areas, chronologies, things like that that you can, um, you can immediately pull down. It has discussions of writing systems. Okay, so each of these worlds of, of, of writing systems is intricate and very different. So it has explanations of that, um, which are also very useful, especially if you have any students that are engaging in um, any kind of research paper of any kind. And it has discussions about um, cultures, ethnohistory, codices or books, pre-Columbian books, so, manuscri so manuscripts um, that we have that survive, and things like that. So it's a, it's a wonderful resource. We don't have anything quite equivalent for the Andean world, unfortunately, but for Mesoamerica, which tends to be, has historically been um, more of a focus among North American um, archaeologists and anthropologists, we do have FAMZ. Okay, so, yes? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, research. Oh, yes. No, 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 you're right. Resources, I'm sure. Yeah. So I went down and I looked at some of the videos and I looked at some of the photographs. And are those copyrighted? Are we okay to use things in our PowerPoint? I believe, oh, no. PowerPoint, as teachers, you can use yeah, anything. I've been using them and I thought. No. Maybe. I mean, copyright only extends to publications when you're publishing things. Okay. But it's all fair use when you're teaching. I mean, this, the goal is that you, it's disseminated widely. Yeah. Or just yeah. Really hard to see. Right. So when they've done the sketches back in the early times, they they're great and they're great. And you know the problem with doing web research is that oftentimes some of these websites are not reliable. Yeah. And so right, the great thing about FAMZ is is this is going to the heart to the heart of the discipline. So these people are reliable, reliable historical, anthropological, art historical information. Okay. So it's it's just a good thing to bookmark on on your computer and to have. Okay. Oh, it even has a section for teachers I didn't even see. Teacher's Guide, Maps. I think it had a map that was unlabeled and then one that was labeled, so you could have kids label things. Oh, okay. That's, That's great. great. Yeah. A great way to test geography, too, for. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go back. Okay, and the last um, sort of, or part of the introductory remarks, I wanted to talk a little bit about museum collections, okay? When you're looking for um, material in the United States and collections that have great, great um, pre-Columbian resources, um, probably the first place that comes to mind is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which has an extensive and beautiful collection of both um, Mesoamerican and Andean art. Okay, so I'm, I'm including just, just some images of the reinstallation at LACMA and this, an artist actually, a um, Chicano artist recently in the last decade recurated the rooms of the pre-Columbian collection and it's fabulous. In fact, if you ever have students that want to do projects on, on and issues of curation and how the display of pre-Columbian pre art and how, you know, how, how one recreates meaning through um, the creation of, of an exhibition space, LACMA is a great example because they did a really kind of avant-garde reinstallation inside. Very theatrical, very interesting, with a lot of kind of sculptural forms um, around sculpture. So it's, it's fun. If you get a chance to go visit it, it, the next time that you're in the LA area, I would highly recommend it. And the other, of course, incredibly important collection for many of your objects, which are Mexico-centric, um, this list is, is, is very much Mesoamerica-centric, is the um, Museo Nacional de Antropología in Mexico City, um, the National Museum of Anthropology. Excuse my double day up there, typo. Um, but the Anthropology Museum in Mexico City um, has many of the objects that we're going to be looking at, including the calendar stone, the coil shauki sculpture that you're looking at. And there are a lot of images online also on the display of these objects. And what's great about, in a way, 
including um, images of installations, is it gives some sense of the dimensions of this. So if you see the calendar stone on the back, it's, it's hard to appreciate when you're just looking at a close-up of the calendar stone just how massive it is, the idea of these massive monolith sculptures that the Aztec produced. So looking at it in a room here, at least it gives you some sense of, of how large it is. And it, not only that, the importance of this object in the museum, because it looks like you know, what, what you're looking at here, it's, it's almost as if it's the, the apex of a cathedral, that it, it's the most important object in the room clearly here. So we can see that even its placement in the room gives, is an index of the significance of the object. Okay, So um, um, there we go. But lots of uh, you know, American museums have great collections, including I saw that here in, in this museum you have um, quite a nice collection of pre-Columbian objects, which I was, I was excited to see. Okay, So let's begin with a discussion of Mesoamerica. And we can use our map here, too, at the same time. So first off, what the heck is Mesoamerica? What is it? How do we talk about it? How do we um, conceive of this as a unified cultural, geographic, and territorial space? Okay. So the term Mesoamerica refers to a, ge a geographic area occupied by a variety of ancient cultures that shared religious beliefs, art, architecture, and technology that made them unique in the Americas for 3,000 years, from about 1500 BC to 1519, the time of European contact. So 1519 is really the end date of our discussion here today. It was when Cortes enters into Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, okay, and it becomes the destruction or the fall of the Aztec Empire. So really, we're looking at sort of the encapsulation of our time frame here is really from um, we have, a, we have you know, two prehistoric objects, um, largely, but we're talking about really a time frame between 1500 and BC and 1519. Meso, and, and actually, that's almost the cutoff date of when we're talking about for the Andes as well, which we'll get to when we do that. So we're talking about the Inca Empire, which was simultaneous with the Aztec Empire, and its fall was also when Pizarro enters into um, the Inca capital. Okay, so we'll be talking about that as two parallel um, discussions of empire. Yes? Um, you know, some people in this room are really, they're, they're world history teachers and they're human geography mm -hmm. teachers besides being art history mm -hmm. people, but boy, you know, I'm not, and I, I need so much help. Yeah, just okay. Just basic timelines. Okay. You know, I mean, when you, yeah. all those things you just said, I, I'm embarrassed that I can't place Pizarro in a place. Yeah. You know, or, or start and stop these places, which is the kind of level of kind of horrific lack of background that suddenly we're being faced with, because now we're supposed to deal with these works. Right, that. right. But, and that requires this whole sort of contextual map, right. history, con conquerors, non-conquerors. And what I, what I can actually do for you, and part of this too is, is, is my inexperience really in understanding you know, where everyone is coming from. I can actually produce for you after I leave here to do a packet that you can take with you to use when you're teaching. And, I, and if you tell me the things that you need, I will, produ I will produce that for you, because I think it's important. Okay, we'll start a list. Okay, yeah, start a list. <laughs> and then you can send me your emails, and I'll do an email around about so that we can have, I can produce an in-depth packet, and I it can be people, places, locations, and dates. Okay, and I've included some of that here, but in a way, it, it's probably too broad, and I can give something that's far more specific. Just don't worry about ever speaking too simply. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> okay, um, so Mesoamerica is one of our is one of our planet's six cradles of early civilization, and many aspects of the ancient cultures of Belize, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico continue to the present in terms of cultural invention and traits that are important today. And one of the things I want us to think about today is the relationship between, um, oh, no worries, um, living indigenous communities today and their importance for understanding the past. So for example, just within the Maya world, a lot of what we know about the ancient Maya world and ancient Maya civilization has come through understanding contemporary living Maya communities today, including our understanding of Maya glyphs and sort of breaking Maya code was really done through understanding living communities. So I think that kind of, um, I don't know, reflexivity between past and present, now and the past is really important for us to sort of be sensitive to. 
um, as, as we move forward. Okay. Um, Thank you, Ronald. Just yes. one other thing, you know, mm -hmm. just reading that second line, mm -hmm. it's one of the six cradles mm -hmm. of early civilization. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so important that we're sort of doing what's happening right now. I thought there were only four cradles. <laughs> you know, no one mentions that there are six cradles. You know, really, we get the Nile and we get the Tigris and Euphrates and China right. and suddenly right. oh, there's two other cradles. Right, right. And, and, okay, and one thing especially that I think is important to, to remember here is the incredible diversity of culture and languages in one particular region. So Mesoamerica here, we're talking about 75 different dialects that existed, okay? <laughs> What's that? Whoa, that's just a ton. Right, a ton. Um, and it's hard for us to come up with what binds these regions together. Okay, so if we have all of these different dialects, we have to think about what, how can we, we conceive of this place as a kind of unified location, and we do that through cultural features that are shared, traditions that are shared, and social practices and ideological beliefs that are shared. Okay. When you say 75 different dialects, that's today, or is that back then? This is today. Yeah, and I actually came up with a, here, here's just to give you some sense, and this isn't something that you need to re necessarily remember, but I brought this in to just give you some sense of the appreciation of the incredible diversity of the region. Okay, and this is actually off of the FAMSI website. So largely what we're gonna be talking about in this class, we're talking about central, we're talking about central Mexico, which largely um, was unified under the Nahuatl language and the Maya region, which, which, which spoke Maya, okay, and ancient versions of such. So we're dealing with really a limited amount, but this is to just show you and give you some sense and appreciation of the incredible diversity, okay. Um, so let's go back. I brought in just this map to show us a kind of a sense of what Mesoamerica is today, or no, I'm sorry, today, what was um, then. And here we can see, um, Again, central Mexico, which is many of our objects are situated here. Um, the apex being Mexico City, okay, which was the ancient Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, and I'll, I'll spell that for you when we, when we get, to, get to that part of the class. And then the green region here, which is largely um, the Maya area, okay. So, <clears throat> Among the high civilizations of Mesoamerica, the ones that are sort of most studied, most discussed, and most featured in textbooks are the Olmec, the Maya, and the Aztec. Okay? That they're featured in this book, and, and it's called from the Olmec to the Aztec, and, and that's really kind of the narrative and the chronology that's charted out in the, in the textbook that I hope that you, that you are able to get. <clears throat> Mesoamerica is a place of great climatic and topographic diversity. So again, we'll, we have to think about what are the things that, that, that unites this area. And there's a difference in altitude and rainfall in different regions. And the difference in that has um, ramifications for how civilizations flourished in different regions of Mesoamerica. Okay? <clears throat> and if we just think about um, the, Az the Aztec Empire, okay, that existed right when Europeans first entered into Mexico in 1519, okay, and a, a lot of, in a way, a lot of the information that we know about Mesoamerica too comes through that, that colonial period around 1519 because we have so many sources that we've been able to gather as historians to look into the past. So we, we use, in a way, we use archaeology, but we also use European sources and chronicles from the 16th century to understand the deep past, okay? But we know, for example, that there was tribute paid to the Aztec emperor, Motecuzoma, okay? Um, and he was paid tribute in jaguars and eagles, exotic bird feathers, gold, jade, okay? Materials and resources that were found in various ecological zones here. So what this tells us in a way is that the Aztec Empire flourished by collecting tribute from various regions around Mesoamerica, where Mexico City was featured as a kind of center. These were the most precious materials, these ephemeral, shiny, luminous, important, colorful things. And you think about that when we're studying the, the art objects. Yes? Oh, you just said his name. Mm -hmm. 
Motecuzome, and I'll, I'll spell it for you. Um, and I'm just yeah. saying, because I'm thinking, I mean, I, I'm thinking of the ones that have probably been um, anglicized. Yeah, Montezuma. Montezuma, right. who you're talking about? Mm-hmm. So, and I would need to know that. Yeah, I will try to, I will do my best. I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to use the terminology that's most current today. But yes, um, he's often called Montezuma because it's, it's Hispanicized. But, but the, the, the name in the period was known as Motecuzoma. So it's M-O-T-E-C-U-H-O-M-A. Motecuzoma, the second. The second. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I'll give you, write down anything that you want to include in this packet and I will do my best to, to provide you. This is meant as a, as a kind of general overview right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of speaking of the, the, the dirt, yeah. but you know, think of how difficult this is to even find out something about, because yeah. I would look up Montezuma, and there would be a Montezuma in the index. There, there, but, there, but there is. I mean, there, there, there will be. Yeah, there will be. You'll find it. You know, so it's hard to even know where to look, yeah. because you don't have the right language with which to look. Yeah. But you'll find but both of both, both names are, are, are basically used all the time. So, <clears throat> okay. So the high cool valleys in Mesoamerica provided a sharp contrast to the steamy lowland jungles. So central Mexico, largely the highland area, much more arid than the kind of the steamy jungle of the Maya region and the Yucatan, which is in green here. So we have various ecological zones that we're dealing with. And cultures flourished in different ways because also of the different ecological conditions and the different things that these regions provided for um, different governmental centers, okay? <clears throat> and the large, dense populations tended to concentrate in central Mexico, okay, in the, in the, in the arid highlands. Now, what kinds of resources and agriculture were available in Mesoamerica, and how were these important? Okay. There was obsidian, which was really the, considered the steel of the New World, okay, which was found in the highlands. And we have things like cacao, which is chocolate, important, and cotton, which grew in the moist tropical regions of Mesoamerica. So a lot of you probably know a lot about, um, or not a lot about, but it's, it's, um, it's interesting to think about the you know, Mexican food today and its connections really to the Mesoamerican past. So chocolate was an, an incredibly important um, ritual drink and beverage, okay? And was also used um, in, other, in other forms as well. And both in medicinal purposes and as a currency and, and in, in, in different ways. So these agricultural items were significant in the development of the Mesoamerican economy as well. So chocolate is big. Um, most civilizations in Mesoamerica were located either in the highlands of, or the lowlands, although the Maya inhabited both. Okay? The earliest civilizations, that of the Olmecs, and I will give you a chronology right here just to show you um, what we're looking at um, from the Olmec to the Mexica or the Aztec. And the, the, the term Mexica is really the Aztecs' own term for themselves. Okay? So we call them the Aztec, but they, it's also called the Mexica civilization. So there, there are two terms to really refer to the same civilization. <clears throat> okay. How do you say the second term, please? Mexica. No, not that. Oh, Teotihuacan, oh. which we won't, we're not discussing anyway any objects from there, but that just at least shows you the chronology. We're, we're looking at one Olmec object, some Maya objects, and Aztec objects in this, in this course. <clears throat> okay, so most Maya development took place in the lowlands, in the, in the region, that, with the gr sort of green area of the map that we looked at, under tropical conditions ranging from rainforest to scrub jungle, and I'll go back to the map so we can look at it again. Um, which is today part of the Yucatan, Chiapas, Guatemala, and Belize. So basically in this map we have ancient sites, which are the triangles, and modern cities and states. Okay, so that you can see the superimposition of both. And this map is from the FAMSI website. You can use it for, for teaching. 
Tenochtitlan, which was the Aztec capital, so Mexico City, and they actually don't include it, unfortunately, on this map, but the ancient Aztec capital was called Tenochtitlan, and I'll spell it for you. It's T-E-N-O-C-H-T-I-T-L-A-N, Tenochtitlan. And he also gave it to us. Oh, great, so great. Have, it's there. Yeah, perfect. You said that was the that was the center of the Aztec Empire, okay? And it was the center of, of life in the valley of Mexico, in central Mexico. Modern Mexico City is built on top of Tenochtitlan. So I don't know how many of you have been to Mexico City, but it's, it's astounding because it's really a, a superimposition of, of, of a Spanish city on top of an ancient Aztec city, okay? And the Valley of, Me of Mexico today still dominates Mesoamerica as it did in antiquity. So still it's really kind of the central hub of, of, of power and resources as it was then, That's kind of, which is also amazing to, to consider. Mesoamerican high civilizations used obsidian tools and weapons in lieu of metal ones. And this is really important. Metallurgy as a craft, so the use of sort of precious metals first developed in the Americas in the Andes. Okay, so we'll be, when we get to the Andes, we're gonna be looking at that. But in Mesoamerica, we're talking about a world where obsidian tools are, are used, okay, for carving, for building, for all of it. And throughout the history of Mesoamerica, the finest objects produced, the finest artistic objects were worked from jade, green materials, such as feathers and jade, as well as stonework, okay, in general. So that, which, is, which is why so many of the objects that we're looking at are made of stone. And why is that? You know, things that are um, made of jade and, and made of the color green were considered precious within the kind of conceptual systems of these cultures. Within the, the kind of mind frame, they were um, luscious, luminous, alive materials. Is it more so than gold? Yes, yes. Gold was important for the Spanish who came in, but from within, what was important were green materials, green stones and jade. So there are sources of jade in Mesoamerica? Yeah, wow. yes. Lots of sources of jade, and turquoise and um, quetzal feathers were also some of the most important tribute and trade items. And we know that there were trade networks between southern New Mexico all the way down to the Yucatan. And we know there were even trade networks across South America between the Inca Empire and Amazonian cultures also trading in precious materials. So there are vast different trading networks that integrated and established dialogue between different cultures, largely through things, things that were valuable and considered valuable. Okay, in terms of new world technology, again, metallurgy was first used in the ancient Andes, okay, which is why we have examples of, of golden jewelry that we're looking at for the Andes. I think there are three objects that are on your list of, of gold jewelry. Um, and long before the emergence of high civilizations in the Americas, so in prehistoric times, humans domesticated corn, beans, squash, tomatoes, and chili peppers. And later, there developed innovative means of high yield agriculture as time moved forward, which allowed, of course, human energy to be spent on other aspects of life, including, oh, okay, go ahead. That Mesoamerican so cultures, yeah, for what kind of yeah. I'm saying Mesoamerican cultures, people living in the in the region domesticated corn, beans, squash, tomatoes, and chili. Okay, there were then after that there was high yield agriculture that developed over time. Okay. And art, the arts flourished um, as, in a way, these civilizations flourished and as populations became more concentrated, of course, artistic produ production increases. We have poetry written and recited. We have books that are made. We have um, intricate astronomy and charting of the heavens. So you have to, I think it's important to understand the, the importance and sophistication of new world Cult, cultural in science, yes. Did most of that then develop after high yield agriculture? Yes. Right. Yep. Do you have a general date when they? Well, I mean, if we're looking at the, 
civilizations that were, I'm sorry. Um, we know very little about the Olmec culture, which is one of the first considered the mother civilization of Mesoamerica. We have very little information um, about that. Largely, the Olmec uh, culture is discussed in terms of, of, of what we understand about religious and ceremonial life. By the time we get to the Teotihuacan culture here, around 150 to 1600, we have massive urban populations in central Mexico. Okay, and they would have to. They would have to, right, right, exactly. Massive urban cities. Okay, so Teotihuacan is a site outside of Mexico City today that was, a, you know, um, flourished as a important corporate entity where there is mural painting and, um, you know, intricate artistic production as well as elaborate building in terms of uh, um, astronomical measurements at the same time. So, mm -hmm. the movements of the heavens were charted, okay? And by classic Maya times, a calendar of interlocking cycles was in use that was as accurate as any known today, okay? And more accurate than the Julian calendar that was used when Cortez and his men entered Mexico City in 1519. Okay, to give you, again, a sense of the sophistication that we're talking about of these cultures. And this is really important to note because a lot of times um, there, are, there are a lot of stereotypes at large about the gruesomeness of sacrifice and bloodletting when we're talking about Aztec and Maya um, art in particular. And yes, these things are, are vital and important, but they're part of political structures. And it's important to, to sort of understand that they, they are happening at the same time as highly sophisticated um, astronomical you know, knowledge is being produced at the same time. So we have to think about, in, in a way, the, the variety of, um, the variety and nuance that's going on within many of these civilizations, okay? <clears throat> and that's something we can, we can debate at large. Powerful lords commissioned monumental architecture characterized by pyramidal constructions, palaces, and frequently these had rich burials inside of them, caches and offerings deep within that testify both to the value of arts and the value of personal power and hierarchical power. Okay, so we're, we're talking about, you know, powerful dynasties that are being built that are based on hierarchical structures. Much of the architecture that we're looking at and then we study in the pyramids that, that we're looking at were not places people lived but they were places that housed caches and that were sort of represent, they were, they were represent, they were representational and symbolic structures for governmental power. In a way, they were symbols. It was like propaganda for a city. Okay, so they weren't places people lived, but in a way, places that you went to on pilgrimage and feast days, and that was a way of showing power in a region, okay? Often where you'd have burials of objects from other regions of the distant empire that you would house inside the pyramid. Okay, so they're a way of symbolically gathering power, if you will. Okay. Here, I wanted to show you just another um, Mesoamerican chronology so that we can get some sense of this. This breaks it down on the left by kind of region in Mesoamerica and then by culture. So again, we're looking at only one Olmec object, then we're looking at um, objects um, or a building from the Maya and objects from the Aztec. Okay. So we're skipping big, big, big chunks of time with a selection of images as well. Okay, our first object. So we have two objects um, that at least are on my list from global prehistory from content area number one. Okay, the first one here is um, the camelid sacrum in the shape of a canine from central Mexico, made of bone. Okay, so where, first off, um, <clears throat> what exactly is this object? Okay, it's, it's important, it's an important artifact and largely I'm guessing this was included on your list um, because it's the earliest artifact we have to have come from Mesoamerica, to have surfaced really within, a, within an archeological record. Um, it's the head of an animal carved from an extinct camelid hip bone. Okay. It was actually discovered not, I mean, it was discovered in 1870 by a Mexican naturalist 
okay? And it went through sort of many different hands, but it's come to be known really as the kind of mothership artifact that we have. This, this is the first one that people usually use to sort of illustrate artistic practice in Mesoamerica. We know that the sacrum is, is now an extinct American relative of the camel, but we don't know anything about the use of this object. Okay, so we know nothing about how it was used and how it functioned. And I'm gonna be hammering in today in a way, it, it's my own, one of my own interests in art history is always to understand the function of art and how art works in a specific time and place. Um, this, for example, we don't have any idea. Okay, so we don't know if it was um, a ritual object, if it was used in you know, some kind of um, ritual way, display, ritual practice, um, but it is, um, it is from the region of the state of Mexico. So it's, it's from the state of Mexico. So where Mexico City is located in the center, we're talking about um, this region, which is Tequixquiac, which is way up on the right-hand side of the state of Mexico. So to give some sense, again, about how the, or, you know, one of these originary objects that we're looking at, again, comes from the central Mexican Valley, the same core arid region that we're gonna be ending with in 1519. So this really becomes, in a way, a, a, a center of importance for archeology. span Is it okay. modern-day Mexico City? Um, no, it's in the modern-day state. So it's in the state of Mexico. So Mexico City is you know, the main metropolis in the state of Mexico. Yeah. yeah. And I think, do I have another map? No, I don't. Yes? Any guesses as to the function? We don't, I mean, no. In fact, I was trying to, I was actually reading up on some of the latest literature, and I'll, I can send you links to those articles. I, I read a paper yep. that said it might be a map, but you know, it's kind of hard to. Right. I mean, no. it didn't necessarily have a context. No, no. And this is, I mean, this is sort of the interesting thing about many of these objects, early objects that we're talking about. They're discovered often by naturalists or random individuals who, of course, weren't concerned at that moment about the context in which they found it, right? So this is different than modern archeologists who when they take an object out of a site, you're interested in mapping where it is in a particular place and, 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 and along with other objects. A lot of these early ones we don't know. Yes? As far as the time frame goes, so did they develop their domesticated agriculture by this point or not? I mean, um, I mean this is really early, this is prehistoric. So this is before large scale okay. agriculture is taking place. So yeah. I, yeah. I I actually I actually don't know actually I'm not I'm not I'm not sure but I would imagine that it's extinct I would guess because right. there's a huge extinction mm -hmm. in 15,000 and 10,000 oops that's that's interesting so yeah worldwide, right worldwide extinction and it's the finding ends by about 10,000 right. It's interesting because a lot, of, a lot of Mesoamerican cultures used found objects and carved with them, whether that's stone or bone or rock or other found things. And a lot of cultures, in, in a way, use what's already available to sort of rework objects. So that's an interesting point. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know. Um, the second object, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so right. you can't know, and I think that that's right. going to be one of the things they're, they're testing, is mm -hmm. that there are multiple theories. Mm -hmm. where you can't know everything, and even with art, we think we know, you know right. now, we just don't know. Right. But the, the one thing I was reading, like, I, I found a really good article, mm -hmm. and I don't have it with me, but right. it was talking about the sacrum being this bone that's basically the spine that mm -hmm. literally Bone in your body because it allows you to move, and mm -hmm. so they feel like I mean the person writes mm -hmm. this, right. you know, trying to prove their theory. Right. That it's that it's a sacred object because of this particular bone. Right. And then um, it said something about I'm trying to remember. Um, it's sometimes associated with resurrection, and I so I started thinking, well, what do we know 
like maybe about Egyptian art or other things that believe in life after death and east and west or you know whatever and I don't, it, for me it just boiled down to another object that kind of associated with life after death or maybe we could go shamanism I don't know but still I like that one better but I think it's interesting that it looks like wolf to me I mean yeah like and, why right. and, and right. you think about the west and how in, in many ways to the native many native populations wolves are very important mm -hmm. I mean, what, what does it mean? Right. And, and what do they want us to do with this? Do you have any idea? Well, Besides saying there's no yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I think largely from what I've been gathering is that this, it was likely a ritual object used, again, probably in a sacred context of some kind. And I think you're probably, I think your point about its materiality, the fact that what it's made out of, the kind of bone, where that bone is, I think those are important um, things to consider in an yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't yeah. just a random boat. Right. It was your leg boat. Right. Right. But, but then I don't know anything about the sacrum, but don't you think that rocks or different objects suggest certain visages or certain objects? For example, you may be inspired from the shape of a bone mm -hmm. to do this, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. but, but it also makes me very curious as, as if this was supposed to be a wall. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, do we have much of a description about how could it be masked like? Example, well, you know, we're also using the words over and over again supposition, perhaps, maybe <laughs> what we don't know. You know, and it's interesting, we do have, I think, was it at seven works, nine works mm -hmm. in this first category, and it may just be that we're noting that that human beings have created art from the earliest moments we yeah, have. And it was all, I noticed they were all exist. across right. the world. So and they're, and like that's that. why perhaps this, that we're, we're not just limiting it to the Lascaux caves. So right. Yeah. That we're saying it's happening everywhere. And that's where those essential understandings for each of these come in. That's the, kind of the context we want to teach. And that's the idea. We don't know what it's for, but we know these very prehistoric people still purposefully Made it for something. They were right. making art for something. Right, an aesthetic object. I think we need right. to make more Right. Right. And it's it's difficult. So how do you interpret object when you have almost no sources, right? And so Well you'd be very careful not to interpret. Right. And not to make great connections between different things when we have no we have no archaeology, we have no written sources here. All we have is what we can see visually and interpret visually. So I think it, it is what we have. We have clearly have an animal form that's being used. It possibly a mask, possibly I mean, a ritual object that could have been used in many different kinds of ceremonies here, um, but clearly made of something that was precious in in some way within that within that place and time. Okay, in terms of a sac the sacrum bone. Okay. That's I, one thing, that's yeah. all these image sets, it doesn't give scale. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't pull the dimensions off of this one, but I can, if I can, when I well, produce a list with, yeah. Well, how big was the camel lid? <laughs> how big was the thing? Could it stay in I saw this contextualized with other objects, and I remember it looking to be about this big, but yeah, but I, I don't know the exact dimensions. Yeah. Large enough to be enough. Yeah. And what makes a mask a mask? I mean, we have one Olmec mask that we'll be, or Olmec style mask that we'll be looking at, but what is it that makes, that, that, what, what makes a mask a mask versus just a sculpture, do you think? Well, right. um, there's an implication that with masks that it could have been worn, whether it's actually worn or not. Okay, and what is, how can you see or tell that an object would have been used or worn? Okay, so in a way you have to have a hollowed out space, yeah. oftentimes. In the old method mass, they said it might not be a mass because it doesn't really have color. Right, okay, so a lot of the pre-Columbian masks that we have, and you'll see this in museum collections, some of them have hollowed out eyes, and some have precious stones that are put in the place of eyes. Okay, so some are symbolic representations of deities, symbolic masks that might have been used in processions or used almost like sculptures. Others might have actually been worn. And so we can tell that through things like eyes, through things like molding on the sides or, or, or places that would have been, um, that would have given you a place to put a string through or some kind of cloth or leather that could hold it in place. So again, we don't, I mean, it's impossible to tell with this. Where, like, we don't know if this was in a grave or a cave or a 
we, it, was, it was discovered in 1870 by a Mexican naturalist. Yeah, Mariano Barcena, that's all we know. Yeah, so we have no context for it, yeah. So I think it's being used here in this list to really just show this is almost like a cave painting where we can, we can chart out a kind of chronology of, you know, this to that, where we're going. If we move on to object number 10 on your list, we have the Tlatilco female figurine here. Okay. Um, made of ceramic from central Mexico, from the, again, central Mexico from the site of Tlatilco, which was also a culture. Okay, so this is a, a particular culture um, that, let me see if, let me see if we can see it on our map here. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's not on the map. But it was a large pre-Columbian village in the Valley of Mexico, so in central Mexico, situated near the modern day, um, modern day, modern day town of the same name in the, in the modern day state of Mexico. So basically in the same location that, that we would be talking about here. It's on this map. Okay, yeah, okay. It was one of the first chiefdom centers to arise in the valley, and it flourished, okay, on the western shore of the major lake in central Mexico, okay, called Lake Texcoco, and I'll spell that for you, T-E-X-C-O-C-O. Okay, a chiefdom is basically like a center of um, a center of governmental power. Okay, and on the flourishing on the western shore of Lake Texcoco during the middle preclassic period, which translates really to 1200 BC to 200 BC, largely in this case. Now, the name Tlatilco comes from the Nahuatl language, and Nahuatl is the language spoken in central Mexico, and I'll spell that for you, N-A-H-U-A-T-L. And the name Tlatilco means the place of occult or hidden things. Now, the cultural production and artworks from this region are noted um, especially for um, the attention to producing different kinds of figurines, figurines of females, okay, baby-faced figurines, and in general, high-quality pottery, okay? And there seems to be a native ceramic tradition that developed out of this region. Especially important are the hundreds of female figurines that have come to light, okay, that have detailed depictions of things like hairstyles, clothing, body ornament, which can, which can carry valuable information really about um, local practices in the area. Sorry. Yeah. The details, sculpted or painted? Sculpted. So if we look at this piece here, what do you note about this female figurine? She appears to be nude. Or, I mean, it's interesting that they have, she has this interesting headdress, mm -hmm. yet no clothes. Okay, she's wearing, okay, she's wearing a headdress. She's of some kind. She's nude. What are the other particular features of her that make it distinct? Because a lot of these cultures, you end up noting distinctive kinds of styles in the way that artists, yeah, yes. Shape of the eyes. Okay. Okay, the kind of slit eyes. Okay, so that's, that's uh, Tlatilco figurines are known in a way for these kind of slit-shaped eyes. Okay. In a lot of them, yes. Yes. Okay. And so, we have, in a way, hundreds of these that have, that have come out of, out of the region that give us some sense, um, largely, of the importance, possibly, of female cults that were in the region, okay? It's, it's one indication. Of 
Female. Cults. Cults. Cults around sort of the female figure and female power. Okay. Was it a matriarchal society? Do we not know that? No, not that, no, not that we know of. It wasn't, but there, even, even within non-matriarchal societies, oftentimes in, in the pre-Columbian and Mesoamerican cultures, there were different um, distinctive female cults within that. Okay, so, so, or different veneration around the female body, um, different aspects of, of the feminine. Okay, yes? I'm not sure if I missed this, but do we, do we know where they were found? No, we don't. This particular one? Or any, I mean, were there, I mean, were they found in grave sites? Were they found in temple sites? Were they found in? We have very little archeological context for this as well. Okay, this is the other prehistoric oh, material. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So it gets that we have more information here as we move forward. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Were there any male sculptures then? No, largely female, which is which is very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Twelve hundred BCE seems late for prehistoric. It's being yeah, but it's being encouched in under the rubric in this AP curriculum as such. But yeah. would there have been writing in the cultures in Mesoamerica by twelve hundred BCE? No, we don't have we don't have evidence really of you know, of that for this region. So we have, you know, language, but we don't have documents in a way that give us any sense of a kind of written history of it. Yes? Are the poses all similar, this frontal no, they, standing? No, they actually, they vary. They vary. But this, in a way, is um, a cl the classic illustration of one of, of one of the figures. And the kind of voluptuous legs, this kind of billowing legs, is one of the... Um, Characteristics of Tlatilco and is also characteristic of a lot of Maya, you know, sculpture as well that we'll be looking at or where that one can compare this to that may give some sense of cultural interaction between regions. Yes? Carved or modeled or both? Modeled. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the highest? Because I looked like when you said no written, I thought the date and you have that date about the same book. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the Olmec eyes are like that. Yeah. Is there a connection there? I mean, we just don't know. We, ju we just don't know. I mean, a lot of the studies of, of Olmec sculpture have talked about that there might have been deformities um, within the Olmec world that led to the production of Olmec. Um, figurines looking the way they do, but a lot of that is supposition, and we don't really have any evidence. And so, was so. she fired? <laughs> What's that? Was she fired? Was she clay and then fired, or just sun baked? Or do we know? As far as I know, it's sun baked and not fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, this one's a little bit different from the one in the set. Uh -huh. The one in the set has two faces to it. Mm -hmm. No, I no, I, I actually didn't see the one on the set. This is the one that I pulled off of the curriculum. Okay. Okay. But, it, but some of them, a lot of them have the two faces too. Mm -hmm. Is that significant? Yeah, I mean, the, there's the, this issue of duality with a lot of Mesoamerican sculpture and this idea of the duality between the male and the female and the different. Okay. 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 Okay, yeah. I thought that this was the one that was actually used, so I didn't see this one. <laughs> this one, yeah, this one, this one, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of um, interest, in a way, by artists in kind of showing and depicting the idea of dual transformations of the human form. And what's interesting to think about with this one is if that's the case or not. But I can look up I can look up more information on this since I didn't know this was the one that was covered. Thank you. No. Okay. You know, another thing we'll be yeah. doing is making connections between cultures and mm -hmm. the, two, the two faces is interesting. I'm thinking of Janus in Yeah. You know, January, but, you know, looking forward to the mm -hmm. seasons, mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot, of, prehistoric. And a lot of prehistoric females worldwide have become more fertility. In mm -hmm. And she does have the voluptuous legs. This mm -hmm. one, she has very voluptuous yeah. legs. But not really a swelling of breasts or 
she doesn't look pregnant by any means. But I think you know a lot of the the idea of the kind of voluptuousness in the, the kind of female form in a lot of the sculptures that we're talking about were related to the act of childbirth and the act of of, of the of this of the of the um, how do we call it scrouch um, how do we call the movement yeah <laughs> when you're crouching down to give birth and the idea of the act and of the hips of being a kind of important right. aspect so my guess is that it would be tied to that yeah also agriculturally mm -hmm. um, they're spending a lot of time on their knees a lot of times in kind of a squatting position mm -hmm. grinding mm -hmm. things like that so you would have the bigger thighs mm -hmm. and the idea of fertility without agriculture absolutely mm -hmm. as a kind of aspect yeah okay I'm moving forward also because I'm concerned we're not going to get through all of our objects <laughs> okay 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 and my god it's snowing outside this is wild <laughs> it's wild yeah exactly yeah okay here we're going we're jumping into the Maya world here <clears throat> I'm specifically showing you um, maps of the map on the left is showing you the Maya region in relation to the rest of Mesoamerica. The map on the right is just a highlighted of, um, of, of, of in a way, the Yucatan Peninsula um, and the different modern day states of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador that encompass what is today um, still part of, of a Maya region. Okay. And we're going to be looking at the, the, the site that was chosen in your, um, in your discussion was that of Yashitlan, okay, which is right here. Okay. So Yashitlan was an ancient Maya city on the bank of the Usumacinta River. And that's U S U M A C I N T A. U S U M A C I N T A River. Now in the state of Chiapas, Mexico. In the late classic period of the Maya world. And I, again, I will hand you out, I'll send you a chronology of the different periods within each civilization, make it easier. Yashitlan was one of the most powerful Maya states along the course of this river, okay? The other major rival location, rival city at this point was Piedras Negras, okay? Which was nearby, okay? But we're gonna be focusing only on, for, for the purposes of today, Yashitlan. Architectural styles, okay, in subordinate sites in the region demonstrate clear difference that mark a boundary between the two locations and two kingdoms. Yashitlan was a large center, it was the dominant power, and it dominated even smaller sites like Bonampak. And Bonampak is, is quite famous for Maya murals um, that you probably have seen illustrated in different areas, okay. Um, and it had a long rivalry with, with both Piedras Negras and with Tikal, okay? The site is particularly known for its well-preserved sculptured stone lintels that are set above the doorways of the main structures. These lintels, together with the steely erected before the major buildings, contain hieroglyphic texts describing the dynastic history of the city. Okay, so before we get into any of that, let's talk a, just a little bit about the geography and the, the kind of location here. So we're located in the state of Chiapas on the Usa Masinta River, which was a watery highway that empties into the Gulf of Mexico, and it was a connector between Maya sites and Maya cities. So all of these, these locations, in a way, um, have sort of connectivity and conversations between each other. And Bonampak and Yashitlan were very, were very close. And we can see um, the different, in a way, the Maya cities and Maya capitals, um, um, oops, here on the, oops, here on the map. On the, on the horseshoe curve of the river, it, this was considered a strategic location. It was a port, 
okay? And there were docks that would enable, in a way, the easy transport of things going in and out of the site. Boats could stop there and trade, for example. <clears throat> and Yashitlan, in the original Maya, was actually translated to what's, what's, what can be called, what we can translate as split sky. And the name replicates the cosmogram around which the site is organized. And this gets, gets to the idea here in that the founding of most major, the founding of all Mesoamerican cities really, are based around um, cosmological principles. And the idea of replicating a kind of cosmogram in stone on Earth. Now, what do you think that means? What do you think it means to sort of replicate, replicate a cosmogram? Connecting from heaven and earth. Okay. So a term that we're going to be using over and over here is the term axis mundi. So it's A-X-I-S-M-U-N-D-I. And this idea that an axis mundi is like an umbilical cord between the heavens and the underworld. Okay. Many of these cities and these sites were considered, in a way, in the middle, the kind of middle ground linking the heaven and the underworld, OK? So this idea that you have to link sort of the verticality of the universe, OK, and put that into sort of concrete, real spatial terms, OK? <clears throat> and that's another unifying characteristic of the building of cities in Mesoamerica, all the way through to the Aztec Empire that we're looking at in the 16th century. OK, here I wanted to give us um, a, the Yashitlan plan, the plans that we can see in a way the various um, temples. Um, and here I, I'm showing you really the Acropolis, so the construction of different buildings in the site. We have a steep embankment with upper buildings and lower buildings. And there's a major plaza area, OK, where major buildings are on hills surrounding it. Now, the Maya architects were very astute. And they were able to plan cities so that the experience would be dramatic for viewers. So we have to think, too, of the building of cities as a kind of visual propaganda of power. Oftentimes, you only access a plaza through different way, different sort of experiences of going through particular kinds of buildings. So in a way, the whole, in a way, experience of walking through or experiencing um, a major ceremonial center was about creating a kind of theater, a kind of theater of power. Another major um, unifying characteristic of the building of Mesoamerican cities was that most of these sites had ball courts, including Yashitlan. Does anybody know anything about the ancient Mesoamerican ball game? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what was it? Things we recognize. Right. <laughs> what was the Mesoamerican ball game? So they use natural rubber balls that are very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. um, they often had to wear padding mm -hmm. in order to play, and they hit it with their hips. It's mm -hmm. really like several pounds. Mm -hmm. And they have um, like little hoops on the sides, mm -hmm. and um, generally it's associated with some sacrifice. Okay, right. It, it's about replicating, in a way, relationships between, um, yeah, right dynastic rulers and different deities, kinds of competitions, or competitions that took place in, in, in a kind of um, world, um, world, in, um, world of the deities, OK? So these were symbolic ball games, OK, that often took place in these plazas, including at Yashitlan. So again, we have the idea of the construction of a kind of center of theater, a kind of a theater of power here. And yeah. Mm -hmm. the inclusion of an arena for sports, mm -hmm. competition. Absolutely. Is this literally the highest place in the area? It is. I mean, oh, the building of all these ancient cities, these sites, was about building the most important buildings on the, on the tallest region possible. 
okay? So that you approach them with a kind of awe, so that in a way, and even the way that the, the architect structured your viewing experience with light would be that you'd enter in in certain ways so that the light would shine on buildings in certain ways at certain times of the day, at certain times of the year. Is the Axis movie somewhere specifically this arrangement of buildings, or does each building have one? Usually, each major site has, its, has, in a way, its principal ceremonial center that is considered the axis mundi of that particular site. Would an archaeologist so. find it by a stone or by a... You, you, no, you usually find this by understanding the construction of a city and which building is most important. Okay. Usually, the center ceremonial building would be considered, in a way, that, yeah, so that umbilical cord. Would the plaza principal be is that kind of the central area? Yes. The central axis is the main plaza. OK, now, <clears throat> first of all, um, Structure 33, and this is where, you know, I'm actually getting confused whether, is this that was included on your list? Yeah. Is structure, okay, I'm just hoping I'm not looking at a completely different list. Okay, so structure 33 is um, one of the most important buildings on, uh, in the site in the, of Yashitlan, and it celebrates the inaugurations of the two most important late classic Maya rulers of the region. Now, one thing I have to tell you here is that the Maya world is incredible incredibly, incredibly complex. And the dynastic history is incredibly complex for each site, okay? So what we're doing here is in a way charting out the most broad strokes that we can for understanding this because understanding dynastic lineage for, for each of these sites is in a way a seminar and a year-long course in itself, okay? So we're talking broad strokes here. Okay, but anyway, this is celebrating the two most important rulers at Yashitlan, which were nicknamed Shield Jaguar, and bird jaguar, okay? Well, where is the first one? Shield jaguar, yeah, and bird jaguar. And when did they rule again? This was, I mean, the city-state here is from, what are our dates? 725? So the shield jaguar, is it like a person? Yes, like the chief? yeah. Okay. Dynastic ruler, we're talking about rulers here. Okay. Again, think about imperial propaganda in the construction of cities. This is all about kind of promoting a kind of power and prestige and highlighting your own, in a way, governorship and rulership. And that would, of course, include all of the low relief carving. Yes. Place. Yes. Were, were they family, like a father son, or were they two different two different, families? Two different, two different dynasties, in a way, coming together. Rising up from great terraces built along the rugged natural relief, these buildings have a commanding view of the river. Okay, so we have to understand, too, the placement of the building in relation to the river. So there's a kind of commanding view. And the architects here positioned roof combs directly above vaults. So this kind of style that you're seeing above here at the very top, those are called roof combs, okay, in the kind of discussion of architecture of the Maya region. Roof combs, R-O-O-F-C-O-M-B-S. Oh, Roof you know combs. Much about those? I, I mean, we can look at the frieze above the doors there, mm -hmm. and that's kind of something we can go again to read. Yeah. And, but roof combs, I don't think we've seen anywhere in... Well, you, you, but you can't make comparisons with other parts of the world here, because we're talking about cultures that are, I mean, we're, we're in the space of Mesoamerica. Okay, they're, yeah, they're, okay, they're both decorative, I mean, architecture always has both symbolic and structural principles to it, almost always, okay, so things are never usually only decorative, okay, things have an architectural a principle that often become aestheticized or become used in an artistic way, okay, <laughs> what's that? Yes, absolutely. Because the idea here, that the power of letting in light in different ways to shine in a way on the building is part of what made Maya architecture, again, so theatrical, too. Okay, so if, if that's in relation <coughs> to the interior, then this is open, ceiling, open roof, like an atrium in the middle? Yes, but okay, so but how is light functioning here? Are we talking about, what, is the importance the interior or is it the exterior? 
Think about it. Yeah. OK, the importance isn't the interior, because these buildings didn't serve really. Much wasn't going on inside the building. The, the importance was the things that were going on outside the building. OK? So it filtered light through the right. whole. Right, exactly. Outside. Right. Because yeah. in a way, we're talking about cere ceremonial structures where activities would take place around them. So crowds of people in the city would populate the outsides, not the insides of them which largely these were used um, in ceremonial contexts and largely had burials and other things inside of them, okay? So like so, the sun coming behind it, right. and you need to have this like exactly. pattern right. steps. Exactly, right, yeah. right. Oh, really so cool. it dazzles. The idea is we're having a kind of visual dazzlement here. And I think, um, I think um, again, one of the interesting things to know is that the Maya were considered in the history of art um, to be really the kind of, um, most important Renaissance culture of the New World, exactly because of the ornateness of artistic practices of both sculpting and building, and also the attention to the, to the carved line, the poetics of the carved line, okay? And this, unfortunately, has predisposed scholars to study Maya art in certain ways more than other regions of Mesoamerica because it was so spectacular visually, okay? Um, so it's, it's predisposed this material to being more privileged in the literature. But the Maya were inc incredible art architects and also just had, when we look at the lintels and the sculpture, it, it, they had an interest really in the delicacy of carving sculpture as if you were carving calligraphic lines, almost like you're painting books. Yeah. So you can see this delicacy when, when we look at Steely and we're going to you know, look at those. Okay, so this building, <clears throat> again, we have um, the celebration of the two rulers. And most Yashitlan structures have multiple doorways. And many have finely carved lintels. Now, what are lintels exactly? Horizontal supports over doorways. Okay. 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 Why are lintels or, or stairs carved, do you think? Why carve them? They're entrances. Mm -hmm. Portals. Yes. And that's a good word, actually. That's a great word. Because you have to look at it to step through it, to step beyond it, to interact with it. This idea that, in a way, as a visitor, as a viewer, um, everything that has a kind of structural purpose that Maya architects want to utilize to have a visual impact as well. So every surface becomes carved. We want to use everything that we can in the visual world to sort of maximize um, the kind of power, really, that the, that the dynasty has over its, its, its subordinates in the city. So you have to look up to lintels, and it places the viewer in a position of subservience. And hierarchy is established. And the Maya are interested, architects are interested in a way in crafting out a visual hierarchy that matched a kind of governmental dynastic hierarchy. So in a way, this hierarchy is about even in the artistry and in the construction of cities. And it also calls attention to, to whose building you're entering. Because these lintels, what was carved on these lintels? Largely dynastic figures. So in a way, it advertises whose building is attached to this, to, you know, to this image. Kind of like the patron. Right, exactly. This is who I am. I am here. And you're entering into my principal ceremonial center. So it's about marking a kind of territory. Well, I, usually the most important carvings are things that would be at eye level. So you have to think really about the human form and that level. So you're not going to have intricate carvings of dynastic lineage in a roof comb, right? No, you can't actually get up there, so the viewer can't get there. So they're use, the architects are using that to do something else. They're using that to let in light in a different way. And largely, lintels and doorways that are carved are things that you, the viewer can see if you're, if you're at the right height. So always think about, in a way, this, is a, this kind of gets back to what Carolyn Dean talks about, about understanding positionality and the kind of space, spatial dynamics of a site. OK. Um, now here we have a monumental building set above the plaza. We have a large staircase. We know that it was stuccoed white or painted red. Another important thing to consider here, and this is important to convey to students, I think, I mean, I, I find this when I'm teaching Mesoamerican architecture all the time, is that these buildings were ornately painted. They were brilliantly colored. And we see them today as these kind of, you know, stone, these kind of black, 
black and white or kind of gray buildings that have this, this kind of look of ruins. But in the period, all these buildings were ornately painted, bright, often red. Red was one of the, the main colors. Red and blue and white were often used and had, and of course, had a symbolism attached to them that was they, nothing, colors were not just colors, but colors were associated with a whole range of ideas and concepts. So I told, I told you again about jade being important. Jade was precious, jade was water, jade was fertility, jade was fecundity, okay? Red was sacrifice, red was a pulsating heart. Red is part of a, of a complex of the nopal cactus, um, connected to foods. So each color in a way had ranges of associations and those associations in a way were connected to why architects would paint buildings in different ways that they did to create a kind of a theater as well. Now, <clears throat> we have to think that the architects wanted in a way to um, produce these buildings in a way where the sculpture would be used in a way that the sculpture would be used for very specific purposes for demonstrating things to a view in public, okay? So sculpt art is not just for art's sake here. Art has a mission. So people had to move past different stele before you went up a staircase. And a stele are, the, are basically these, these stone sculptures that had images carved into them. And you can mm -hmm. back to your map of the Acropolis mm -hmm. to show us where this building is. Mm -hmm. Temple 53, right here. And you said it was uh, the center. Geographical area is higher, but it was also intended to be elevated even from that. So the idea is that you, you have a kind of staircase. Um, you ascend the staircase largely because the, the building of staircases was mimicking kind of ascension into the heavens. Okay, so you build up just like you're moving through layers of the universe. Okay. One last question. Yeah. I don't see any carving now. Has the carving been removed and placed in a temple, or, or not a temple, but like a museum or a? These, oh, you mean in here? Most of, I mean, and this is going to be true for most of the, the things we look at, most of the steely have been removed and looted and removed and are now housed in different museums. Okay. So a lot of the, for, for example, a lot of the Maya steely that we have today are housed in the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, or they're housed in regional museums around the U.S. Which also makes it difficult in a way for people to, when they go to these sites to understand in a way the relationship between these dynastic images and the architecture because everything now is disjointed. Yeah. What would you see when you went inside the doors? What's that? What would you see when you when you went entered the rooms? We don't really know. I mean, there bare we know that there were burials held inside of it. Okay. We don't know, and my guess is that probably there were dynastic ceremonies that enter, where, where certain people, privileged rulers, would enter and come out of and emerge from different portals, okay? So, I want to understand this. Sure. It, there's not a great deal of space necessarily in mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Fairly limited. Mm -hmm. So, can we see it from an overview? We don't know how large it was. It's configuration. I, I mean, I actually I don't have I don't have an image of an overview image of this. Unfortunately, I didn't bring one in. But do we know it was it square? Is it rectangular? Did it spin? It's largely rectangle. Okay. And it's the the back of it largely looks quite like this, except that we don't have any entrance. So there's no entrance. So it's it's in a way cut off in the back. So what we're seeing is a kind of front entrance that isn't mirrored in the back. Okay. I mean, you said the stairs were also um, carved. So there might have been carvings on the front sides of each of these stairs. No, stairs are often carved here. These stairs are not carved, okay. but they, they represent, in a way, the 13 levels, okay, 13 levels of the universe. Oh. So most temple precincts, in a way, had a set of stairs that would perform the function, in a way, of highlighting kind of the ascension, okay, of a ruler into the universe. So the crowd mm -hmm. would not go. The observer would not necessarily no. go. This is more ceremonially used, and then the, the ruler would ascend and pop in and out of the building. Absolutely. 
and, and pure the theater. Just don't get to go in. To no, these are highly stratified societies. Very, the average person did not have access to these sites. But it was okay. important that we be there to see this. It'd be important that if you were a citizen in Yashitlan, that on certain feast days you would go to the ceremonial center and you would watch a kind of ritual production and ascension of a ruler. Okay. At different, you know, at different important moments of the year, okay. But largely, a viewer would be would be right here, would be placed in the middle, okay. Large crowds, okay, where the, the few dynastic performers um, would have been the ones that were that were ascending the stairs, interacting with the doorways, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's go to. Um, let's see. Here I'm just giving you an image of, of the west of Acropolis just to give you a sense, a different viewpoint of a construction. Is this one of the images on your list? I'm not this on the list. Okay. But to just awesome. yeah, to just give you some sense of in a way of what these palace complexes look like, okay, at least today, to give sense in a way of the kind of verticality, the idea of the kind of moving and ascending into the heavens that we have. Okay. But here I want us to move to. Okay, go ahead. One thing about looking at those temple sites too, you have to remember that when they were first discovered, they were covered in jungle. Right. I mean, you wouldn't have known that it was even there. And so there's been a ton of excavation in order to get it to actually pop out. Right. Right. Are they using concrete or mortars? They're, I mean, they're using stone to build these, but oftentimes um, the surfaces would have been um, stuccoed and painted on top of it, which we no longer see today, which is part of the problem. We have to kind of imagine or we have to do. And there are a lot of really interesting, and this is something that I, I actually can include this on the list for you in the packet. There are video reconstructions, and actually UC Berkeley and the team of archaeologists there have done reconstructions of virtual real-time experience in these temples so that you can actually walk through them. And that, that probably would be really actually fun for students to be able to experience. I'm not sure if this is all free access, but I, I will find out if, if we can get links to that because it's in a way almost creating video game experiences of what it's like to move in real time with the effects of light and color. Because so much of this is a kind of nonverbal experience. It's experiential, right? And it's hard to understand the dimensions and the kind of mood of lighting that it, that it, that it would be to be a participant inside. And that's something that a lot of scholars are interested in doing now, kind of using technology to produce experience. <clears throat> now, let's go to in a way the lintel um, number 53 that we see here. Now, these lintels are a major art form in the Maya world, okay? Um, Again, many of these are decontextualized now and they're in museum collections all over the place. And here, this one, the number 53 that we're looking at is at the Museo Nacional of Anthropology in Mexico City. Another object that you can see if you visit there. And we can see these, these carved relief sculptures in stone, okay, that show dynastic images. And what anthropologists have done largely is that, is that usually a rubbing is always produced, okay, so that you can understand the relief um, much, much easier than just looking at the stonework. So the, what I'm showing you here is a kind of a rubbing on paper that is, that is used and tr you know, traced, traced so that we can understand what we're actually looking at on the left, okay? Now the iconography, okay, and this, this gets back again to the kind of Carolyn Dean piece, what is it that we can recognize here? It's, it's hard, right? Because we're, we're entering into a completely different kind of visual system. Okay? So what we're actually looking at in, in, um, in broader strokes here is we're looking at, in a way, the relationship between a couple, a husband and a wife. Who's the husband and who's the wife, do you think? <laughs> Big guy with all the dress on, the big decoration, <laughs> the fancier clothing. Yeah. Okay. Big dress. Okay. Okay. So. Figure. Okay. So on the right, 
On the right. On the right. Okay, so that's a man. That's the figure. And guess who it is? But it's Jaguar Shield. One of the last governors of Yashitlan. And what is he wearing? And the ornate ritual headgear, an apparatus of power. So in a way, you're very powerful in the Maya world, like you are in all over Mesoamerica, by the things that you wear. The clothes that you wear make who you are. The designs, the ornateness, the things you're attaching to your body. So it's a way of, in a way, taking a kind of um, naked body, making it into this kind of ornate body that's part of a kind of state construction of power. Do we have any artifacts of the actual things that were worn, or is it mostly through these lunch ones? Yeah, that's actually a lot of what I personally do my research, I work on. It's um, very little. We have very, very little because this material is ephemeral and it gets lost. What did he found? Yes. yes. So he's wearing a giant Quetzal headdress. A giant what? Quetzal. Q E T Z A L Z A L. What is a Quetzal bird? Little green bird. Okay, and I, I, I I'm actually bringing. I, I brought one in to show you with the headdress that we're, that we'll be looking at. But yes, okay. So the Quetzal bird was one of the most precious birds in Mesoamerica, and especially the Maya region, because the feathers were the color of jade. They were a brilliant green, and they were long. It was the long tail feathers that you made headdresses out of. Okay. So just like the multi-chromosomal headdress that we're going to be looking at as an important object, here we're actually seeing the use on a ruler of Quetzal feathers to denote a kind of power, power over the region. Because if you could get Quetzal feathers from all over Mesoamerica, you were important, right? Mm -hmm. What else is important about what he's wearing? Human head. Is he wearing armor? He's wearing armor, exactly. He's wearing, I mean, he's wearing a ceremonial belt with different faces all over it. He's wearing, um, you know, ankle paraphernalia as well that's key, okay? He has nose piece. He has nose jewelry, okay? So piercings that are important that denote a kind of, a kind of power. And who is the, the, and what about the woman that he's with, okay? She's, it, he's opposite his wife. His wife's name is Wind Skull, okay? And how do we know that it's, that it's a woman? What gives us a sense of, is, that, is she like pregnant or is she holding she's something? Holding something? Okay, she's holding something. Okay. Is it the dress? What's that? Is it the dress? Yes, um, she's. Shirt? We know. We know it by her in a way. Yes, she's wearing a long garment that covers her body. She's smaller than him. Okay. And. Yes, exactly. So the glyphs that we have throughout all of these stelae give us an indication of the narrative that's going on. They tell us who the major players are in the image. Okay. Yes. And the object he's extending in his right hand that right. terminates in what looks here to be like a serpent. Exactly. He's and giving her a serpent sword. A serpent sword. Sword, yeah. Okay. A ceremonial serpent sword. And the sword, in a way, is personified, right? We can see that it's alive and it's a little person, right? So, in a way, he's handing over a serpent sword. And the sword, in a way, is a person that also has a headdress. And that, that also is ornately. Um, Decorated as well. So it's not a deity. Hmm? It's not a deity. Representation. Of a deity. What's that? It's not a representation of a deity. Well, that, no, no, but but in a way, serpent swords were part of a kind of ritual apparatus that were often considered alive as well. Okay. So he so he's handing her this. Okay, and it's giving us a sense of this is okay. So why would this be significant to have on a lintel on a on, on, a, on a piece of carved stone connected to a major structure. Well, we had all the steel of Hammurabi where he's giving things to give laws, and so it's showing power from an important source to maybe a different source. Right, but it's, but it's in a way mapping out a kind of genealogy of a particular a kind of family and a bloodline connected to a place. Okay, we rule this place, we're a bloodline. So you have to have a woman in there, right? You have to have, in a way, the idea of procreation and the idea of a couple that is producing a kind of lineage that's connected to a site. That their offspring will control the region. Okay? The hieroglyphic centered, the ones in the top and in the bottom surrounded by the box. 
Yes, those Yes, those are the glyphs that can to, 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 to telling us who's basically in the image. Okay. But yes. Does it also legitimize her power within that community? Of course, absolutely. All of this is about legitimizing. Absolutely. Now we're not looking at you know images like this, but many of many of the stone carvings also show the idea of bloodletting as a kind of ritual that's significant for the Maya world. Now, bloodletting bloodletting is significant. Why do you think? How could that be connected to dynastic rule? Well, it was taught to me that the royal blood was the blood that had to be shed to save the people or to okay. help the people, which kind of is a Christian thing. But it's also, when they do it in the lintels, they're doing it to get visions. I mean, part yeah. of it, too, is pain to get to a vision, to talk to ancestors or get information. And there's a lot of... There, yeah, there are a lot of different layers to it. But a lot of these images will often show royal bloodletting. Okay, but it has For different parts of the body, of a dynastic ruler, you would bloodlet. You'd bloodlet with thorns. Thorns of a cactus in your, basically in your tongue, your penis, your hands, different areas. And that would be this idea of the ideology of reciprocity that you're giving to the gods and the heavens to, cre to generate and regenerate your own dynastic rule. So it's a kind of, uh, it's kind of, it's almost an auto-sacrifice of part of yourself to regenerate the continual rule of your own bloodline, <laughs> right? So it's connecting in a way the cosmos with your dynastic rule. So often many of these stone sculptures will feature that, and you'll see that in small bits. This one does, this one does not, okay? Is that but, what's happening in this one? We do it looks like it. How do you do it? How do you do it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't see this on the list, but yeah, that is showing the piercing in a way of bloodletting as a dynastic ritual. And there's only information on this one that she's letting the blood for a son to a different line, which is interesting in the mm -hmm. so There were several lines. Often there were several lines. Um, yeah. And that also was something about the, uh, the state she was in when she did it. So she, it was like a hallucinogenic state that had something yeah. Well, oftentimes hallucinogenics were taken during ritual bloodletting as a way of, in a way, I mean, reducing pain, but also entering into a kind of sacred space, right? Mentally, that you would. Was there a serpent particularly Yes, because in a way, the serpent, the serpent. The serpent's connected to both. The aquatic world and the terrestrial just don't So the most important animals in Mesoamerica were animals that moved between the world. The serpent was connected to fire, it was connected to water, it was connected to this, this kind of slithering movement between parts of the universe. Which is why Quetzalcoatl, who's the feathered serpent, is particularly important in the iconography of Mesoamerica because he's a serpent that has feathers. So he well, that makes him all the can go anywhere. He's a superpower, right? He, has, he can fly. Okay, he's terrestrial. And serpents are always connected to the idea of, how, of fire as well. So in a way, the idea of creating these animals that have multiple dimensions of them. Is the jaguar linked there as well? The ja yeah, the jaguar is significant because the jaguar has night vision. So the jaguar can see where the human can't see. Yeah. yeah. On your list of things, would you give us sort of like the animals and what they signify? I can. If you would be awesome. I'll add it to the list. Make, add it to the list. Add to the list. <laughs> Just add, make a master list and I'll find the list. Yeah. Hey, Cheryl. How about if we just did visiting lecture days? Yes. <laughs> And then we'll come back and we'll do the Aztec material. Yeah. Mm. So there's food. Okay. Okay.